the mysterious girl carrying a dog turns out to be Flora in disguise. Unable to send her back to London, the professor consents to letting her tag along on the adventure. With little Tom in tow, Leighton, Luke, and Flora head back to reunite Babette with her baby. Good morning everybody, it's Midnight and Beyond, welcoming you back to the world of Professor Layton and the Diabolical Box. In the last episode, I really don't need to do that because we had one of those recaps just now. But in this episode, we're going to go forward with our old pal, Flora. Very glad that she's here with us, it would have been kind of lame if uh, she just got introduced in that one game and then we never really saw her again. But, no, uh, she is... it's never really outright said where her place is. Like, presumably she lives with Layton, like he's her caretaker now, and I guess she'll just stay with him until she is old enough to live on her own so i don't know it's just kind of weird that uh they left her hidden until now but i'm very glad that she's with us but enough about that let's go ahead and return to the doggy i think i was just set up there as a go here oh thank heavens you're all right my sweet little tommy boy i miss you so yep yep this is tom we were under the impression that we were searching for a boy, not a mutt with a fancy haircut. How dare you compare my darling Tommykins to some common street mongrel. Us dogs are no matter for Scotland Yard. The next time he goes missing, find him yourself. Blimey, some folks haven't an ounce of sense. Come on, Barton, we've got real cases to solve. Um, you got it, Inspector. Don't you walk away from me! I'm not done talking about your atrocious manners! Well, enough of that. Welcome back, sweetie. Why did my little Tommy get run off to today? He's such a darling that I feared someone might have kidnapped him and been holding him for ransom. Is that what Flora was doing? Um, perhaps we should keep Flora's involvement in Tom's disappearance under wraps. Good idea, my boy. <laughs> I do believe a reward is in order. Here, yeah, I know it's quite ahem, generous, but I insist. We got a new hamster toy. Use this pet house to help your hamster get in shape. I hear we'll be making quite. I hear we'll be making a stop in a quaint village by the name of Dropstone. How much longer until we get there, Professor? I'm not entirely sure, but waiting here won't make the time pass faster. Let's rest while we wait. At least that got wrapped up rather quickly. Tom's disappearance. It turns out that Tom isn't a child and was, as was thought originally, but rather Babette's pet dog. It would seem that Babette's affection for Tom is so deep that she considers him to be much more than just a pet. Such riveting importance to the overarching story. The Professor, Luke, and Floor decide to return to their quarters for the time being. Okay, let's go. Say, Flora, where have you been hiding all this time? Well, until I found out that little dog, I'd just been relaxing in my room. Really? You've got your own room? Sure I do. It's the middle one in the third car. Wow, you do know that's the room right next to ours, don't you? You were just a wall away from us, and I never so much as suspected you were there. It would seem that my powers of observation are a bit rusty. Eek! My word. Why is the train stopped? What's going on? Samuel, you don't! What did you do this time? Hey boss man, chill out, there's a downward train like just sitting on the track. Until we can move that thing out of the way, we're not going anywhere, man. Then get your rear and gear and move it out! I won't have your laziness tarnishing the Mulintary Express brand. But I'm just the MC, shouldn't we get someone a little more, you know, gear-headed to handle this? Besides, train cars are heavy, man, how am I supposed to move it? I will not hear excuses, especially from a layabout conductor who barely earns his keep. I don't care how you do it, just get it done! Okay, okay, I'll give it a shot. Just turn it down a notch, Unko. Unko? 
I might be your uncle, but I am also a president of this railway, and I demand you address me as such. Okay, alright, sure, whatever you say, Mr. President. Looks like we got ourselves a bit of a detour, whether we like it or not. But we got some hint coins along the way, so that's nice. Uh, if we can find any new places to tap that might have hint coins. Really not doing a good job of finding them, I feel like. Maybe there's just less of them this time around. I really don't know. This doesn't seem to be any around here. And he doesn't have anything to tell us. Bah, I'm too nice to that indo indolent, scruffy nephew of mine. All the Laos does is complain. I mean, like what you're doing right now. Can't go back into the train, so we're just going to go outwards for now. Maybe we could see what's up. What seems to the... What seems to be the problem here? Oh, sorry, Mr. Passenger. See, there's this giganto freight train passed on the track, and it's blocking our way. Clearing the track is going to take some time, so um, just sit back with some fizzy and wait. I see. Can I lend you a hand? For real? Oh, yeah, that'd be way helpful. You think you could find a way to move that train blocking the track so we can, like, get a move on? Step aside now. We're not going anywhere until that train moves off the track. Let's see if Layton can get all beefed up and throw the train off the track. Then he'll finally get added into Smash Brothers. No, unfortunately not. It's not like that. Until we get the car out of the way, the Molotar Express isn't going anywhere. Here's the puzzle. Puzzle number 26. Train Swap. Swap the positions of the two trains along the tracks. Move the cars one at a time and make sure the numbers by the side of the track match the numbers on each car. Uh, it's not that simple. We actually need to have access to the other train and to make it move. We can just, like, slide around on the little puzzle right here, but whatever. Hint number one. Your first goal is to get the cars from the shorter train to their assigned places. Hint number two. Move the red car marked one to the space on the far right side of the upper track. After that, move all of the white cars down to the lower track, and you'll be able to slide that first red car into its ass assigned spot. Hint number three, apply the method described in hint two to move the other two cars, and you'll have those trains switched around in no time. The solution, we gotta move... Okay, okay, I'm gonna... Try and do this somewhat competently. Uh, let me see if I can zoom this out. We've got a step-by-step -step solution. It's like another sliding puzzle, sort of. Uh, we're going to want to put number one over here. It's, like, it's weird. Like In the diagram, the trains are different colors. Uh, for some reason. Or maybe... I, okay, I was just doing the wrong one. Excuse me. Put this number one up here. And then number two goes... In the center. Uh, next, we're going to put number three over to the left. And we're going to want to put number two down here. Drag uh, one, two, and three down this way. Uh, keep number four there for now. So we could bring number two or number one down here. Number four is going to get dragged over here, and then one, and a two, and a three, and a four. I'm just in tutorial mode, it seems. I'm just really excited for that Dora movie. Test my theory. A true gentleman leaves no puzzle unsolved. That's right. Let's take a drink for every time I say that in this LP. Hopefully we should be able to continue our journey now. Yep, I reckon we're good here. Give me just a sec, we'll be up and running again. That was a very short detour. I was expecting some, like, scandalous thing to be out on the tracks. Be like, oh my god, it's the diabolical box that was blocking the road, or something like that. We're finally moving again. It shouldn't be much longer before we arrived in drop zone. I wonder if we'll find any useful information there. I hope so. Got a round part. Use it to rebuild the camera in the professor's trunk. Okay. And puzzle number 26 was added to the puzzle index. Uh, we could have missed a puzzle, apparently, but, uh, we got them all, so we're good. Save your progress? Uh, not quite yet, because we're still going with the episode.
Chapter 2, The Country Village of Dropstone. It's a cow of evil! That sudden step back there did a number on our brakes, so we're stopping here for the repairs. We got at least three hours till we'll be ready to roll, so why don't you catch the local sites? Capital idea. Besides, who knows what information we might stumble upon in this village. The Professor, Luke, and Flora decide to take in the sights around Dropstone. I genuinely- I, I'm never gonna get over that, because like I don't remember those being a thing in the slightest, but now it's just every stinking five seconds. And hey, a puzzle. Look at this poster of a train, Professor. Yes, yes, it's quite lovely, Luke. Oh, but there's something quite odd about this picture. Huh? What do you mean, Professor? Puzzle number 27, a dramatic farewell. Train stations are an especially good place for dramatic farewells, aren't they? Below is a picture of a man and a woman bidding each other a tearful goodbye. Somewhere within this picture is a single unrealistic detail. Find and circle that unusual area. Hint number one. There's nothing wrong with a dog. That's it. Okay. Great hint. Hint number two. The moon hanging in the sky and the lamppost are fine as is. Oh, and don't bother searching the man in the foreground of the picture either. Hint number three. The detail you're searching for has to do with the train car. Once you've spotted it, you're sure to shout, There's no way you can move it like that! The solution is... Uh, I'm trying to understand how this is the solution. The solution is the glass at the top of the open window. Is it that you can't open a window on a moving train? Or on a train in general? Maybe that's it. Let's find out. Just leave it to me. Piece of cake. Good eye. Were the man in the picture to open the window as shown above, the frame would go through the roof of the train. Huh. Okay. Oh, okay. I see it. I know how how train geography geometry works now, sort of. Uh, most trains have windows that either slide down into the body of the train or allow only one portion of the window to open. Of course, thanks to today's modern air conditioning, a good number of trains have been fitted with windows that don't open at all. I heard that there's apparently airplanes that have showers on them now, and I'm like, seriously? What the fruit? Oh, right there. That was the odd section. And we got a two-sided part again. I don't know how we get these pieces to the camera and like all these random parts of the world. But whatever. Not going to question it. Just going to keep on going with it. This guy doesn't have anything for us. He's just talking about his uncle. So the village was founded only 50 years ago. That's quite young for a settlement in these parts. And it's so peaceful here. I really can't believe we'll find any clues about the Elysian box. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure of that, Luke. Remember, one of the first rules of puzzle solving is that the answer is often the, in the unlikeliest of places. Of course you're right. I'll be sure to keep my eyes peeled for clues, Professor. As Sherlock Holmes once said, you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains must be the truth. Uh, we can't actually go back into the train, so I don't have to worry about touching the door and actually walking through there again. Like a certain other area, got a hint coin. Uh, anything else around here? Oh, you could examine the poster again. Uh, there's another hint coin right in there. And one more in the cracks. Very nice. Okay, we can move forward. Into the village, probably going to meet some new characters, or some old ones. Uh, Granny Randleton Shack is out here right now, in case you wanted to access her, since we can't go back into the train. Uh, she probably says something different. Be like, hey, I'm out here now. Oh, hello! Fancy seeing you here. I like her stinking expression. She's just, like, pulling her head down and, like, having a big, cheesy smile. Me? They've booted me out of the train until they fix it. If you're after a few puzzles to pass the time, just take a peek inside my shack of wonders. I'll be here until I get back on the train, so just come by if you get a hankry for a puzzle. You know, it's sort of weird that she travels around with, like, a tiny miniature house to hold all the puzzles, but she did say that she wanted to give all the forgotten puzzles a good home. So it's literally the puzzle's home, which is kind of funny. Okay, we got a hint coin right there. And I did not mean to examine him, but whatever. Well, Mr. Layton, how are you enjoying your time here in Dropstone? It's been delightful. Every once in a while, it's nice to leave the city and enjoy the countryside. 
The air is so clean and fresh. I'm so jealous of the people who get to live out here. I couldn't put it better myself. There's something about this place that makes you feel like a new man. And with the village celebrating its 50th anniversary today, our timing couldn't be better. Come to think of it, your Molentelli Express turned 50 this year as well, did it? it? Quite the coincidence. Uh, yes, indeed it did. Sheer coincidence, of course. Still, it could have been fun to celebrate your train's anniversary here at the festival. Well, we already have a grand 50th anniversary celebration planned at an exclusive venue in London. Oh, is that so? Well, I'm sure your party will be on par with the excellence of your train. Yes, and on that note, I'm afraid I'll have to excuse myself. Good day, Mr. Layton. Good day to you, Mr. Beluga. My, it's already been a year since she passed. Time truly does fly by. She? Who do you think he was talking about, Professor? I haven't the foggiest, Luke. He's all well composed whenever he's around Layton and Luke, but like, we definitely saw his true nature when talking to his employees. I don't think he's sucking up to Lane because like, he didn't even know who we were when we first met him, so I guess he's just trying to keep a good uh, public image when he's around people that aren't his workers. Now we need to go in there. Uh, but yeah, we can go to the left or the right. Oh, wait, right. Left is just where we came from before. And yeah, even though Flora is traveling with us, she doesn't talk all that much during cutscenes. You can see she's still with us in that little icon, dancing icons right there, but uh, she really doesn't interact much, which I kind of wish she did, but oh well. Uh, let's see what we got here. If we can find any more hidden things. Oh, really? I thought the wreath would have something for sure. I was certain about the wreath, but apparently not. Nothing? Really? Come on, you gotta give me something. Give me some sort of hint coin somewhere. You got nothing. Okay, good to know. And not even a puzzle. What a completely useless screen. Oh, ho, what, sir? What? And who do we have here? Visitors from out of town? Indeed we are. We we were traveling on the Molentary Express, but we've stopped here for repairs. If you're here for repairs, I bet I know where you're headed. Oh, really? What do you mean, sir? Mm, oh, I um was just thinking out loud. Yep, just chat with myself. Forget about it. Say, did you notice the festival that's running today here in Dropstone? Today marks the 50th year since the founding of our village. Make sure you get in on the fun. That was an interaction. Maybe this screen wasn't as useless as I thought it was going to be. Huh. We'll just keep moving forward, I guess. Wow, look at all the stuff there is to do. I've never been to a real live festival before. It's wonderful. Oh, that's right, Flora. I'd forgotten how you grew up in that one little village. Well, now's your chance to make up for lost time. Let's explore. That's a great idea. Where should we go first? Oh, let's go in that booth over there. I want to see what they got. Wait for me. Ha ha ha. You two watch where you're running, or you're liable to crash into something. Hello. Uh, first up, before we address that very foreshadowing shadow. Oh, okay, got a puzzle. Um, can I just say, like, she is so excited about a festival, says, like, she's never seen one before. They had, like, a sinking amusement park carnival built in her village just for her. Like, what is she being excited about? I guess, like, because they weren't real, but, like, it's not like it's something that she hasn't seen somewhat similar things of before, and that was really poorly worded. Look at all the fruits and veggies on that cart. It probably belongs to the person running that little stand. Oh, but it looks like one of the wheels is dented. That must make it difficult to move t to move much. Yeah, I bet it's a real pain. Oh, but you know, that reminds me of a puzzle about a busted wheel. Get a puzzle from Flora this time. Puzzle number 28, the warped wheel. Let's warp the wheel again. In the back of the train yard, there's an old warped wheel lying on the ground as shown below. A star is pointing to its axle. While no longer functional, the wheel is interesting because when rolled on a flat surface, its axle traces a funny pattern if you look at it from the side. Of the five diagrams below, which one depicts the actual path of the axle? So, multiple choice. Hint number one. This wheel's shape is essentially a triangle with the corners rounded off. 
Since the axle is positioned close to one of the corners, you can, expert, you can expect the pattern to, it creates to be rather unconventional. Hint number two. The axle is positioned far from the center of the wheel, so you can expect the path it traces to contain an exaggerated up and down movement. Hint number three. B and E are not the answer. Choose from the remaining three options, and don't forget what you read in hint two. Got it memorized? The solution is A. Here goes. Piece of cake. That's a overused catchphrase. That's right, Luke. You sure figured out that one fast. If you got puzzles, I've got answers. I'm impressed you knew a puzzle like that. I never heard that one before. Well, I need to know a few to run with you two. Seriously, you're surprised that Flora's inter interested in puzzles? Like, isn't everyone in this universe interested in puzzles? I don't know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I actually didn't read the little flavor text at the bottom. It was actually kind of funny. It says, you probably won't see this wheel on a train anytime soon, but it would sure be fun to watch it bounce around, wouldn't it? Of course, the one time I skip, uh, there is something funny. Of course, I skip over it. We get another puzzle over here. What are all these arrows for? Oh, it's a carnival game. What the fruit? Angus! Hello there, Angus! Say hey, this good strike a hand at the fine game of skill! I'll tell you what, since business is so slow right now, the first try is on me! Gosh, really, mister? Oh, well, I can't say no to a deal like that. Come on, Flora, we could try it together. Puzzle number 29, the winning arrow. A bag of candy dangles from one of the three arrows attached to the wall. Assuming that all three arrows are perfectly straight, which arrow, A, B, or C, is connected to the candy? Another multiple choice. Hint number one. Don't trust your eyes! This puzzle contains an optical illusion! Hint number two. Instead of looking at this one straight on, try rotating your Nintendo DS a little so that you have a diagonal view of the puzzle. It's always weird when they outright say Nintendo DS in the game. Hint number three. Here's an interesting bit of trivia. This particular optical illusion is known as the Poggendorf illusion. Again, another useless hint. I think this is when the hints start getting like uh, kind of funny. Where like if you buy hints when you really shouldn't need it at this point, then like they kind of just give you sass for it. Be like, why the fuck are you spending money right now? But whatever. The solution is a B. And also in the American version, it's called candy, but in the UK version, it's called sweets. Riveting. Hmm. Let's see if this works. Piece of cake. Don't you mean piece of candy? Good eye. Arrow B is the one attached to the candy. The reason this puzzle is tough for some people is because it contains a famous optical illusion. When you obscure a portion of the diagonal line with a straight shape, the two visible portions of the line appear disjointed from one another. Nicely done, Shorty. Here's a little something for that fine performance. Really? Gosh, thank you. And we got a spring part. He gave us a broken piece of a camera. How wonderful. And a puzzle. Cool. What do we got? We got a hint coin. Very nice. We got nothing else. We could examine this cart. We got all the little booths set for the festival. Okay, nothing new. Uh, We got another hint coin there. And this guy right in the back, we could talk to him. Or this girl, excuse me. It's Lulu! Lulu, it's you! I have a cat named Lulu! We're doing some top secret festival prep work back here, so you can't come in yet, okay? Uh, what else? We could go to the left or right? We came from south, right? Uh, yes. Came from south, correct. Always, it always confuses me when, like, uh, I'm driving and something like that, and... I'm asking where, which direction to go. I'm like, you want me to go to the left? And they're like, right. I'm like, no, you want me to go to the right? And they're like, no, left, left, right. I mean, like, correct or right? Direction right. Can you, like, be clear before we crash or something? Oh, boy. It's always really nerve-wracking. Uh, I'm trying to deduct which area would be a dead end, which one would be progress. This one looks like it might... Actually, judging by the grass on there, we probably can't cross over. Uh, and, yeah, there's a single screen in here, so... We'll stay right here. Uh, ignore the guy with the big nose for now. And get a hint coin. Get... Uh, nothing we can examine in there. 
I really wish the text boxes disappeared after you examined it once. It's always just flavor text. Harnessing the power of nature is quite an impressive feat. Like, it's never anything super funny, but, like, after you saw it once, you should probably be allowed to not see it anymore. This guy's got a puzzle for us. Costia. Gracious, the weather couldn't be finer for celebrating Dropstone's fancy 50th. My memory's not what it used to be, but you're not far from here, are you? Or you're not from here, are you waiting on the train, hmm? How do I know, you ask? Well, this is the first time it's happened. As fancy as that train is, it must be right in shape. Take heart, Sonny. Most, more often than not, this train gets fixed up in a few hours. What, with the festival and all, there's plenty here to do and see in the meantime. Thank you for that information. If I could trouble you for a moment, though, I'd like to ask you about the relic known as the Elysium Box. Oh, dear me! Ahem, I mean, oh, dear me, I've never heard of that dreadful thing. Never, you hear? Hmm? Well, that's enough chatting with strangers for one day. To be frank, I was high as spirits till you came along. Now I'm crabbier than a crab apple. If you really want to prove you're sorry for this, for ruining my day, solve this your puzzle. Jeez, how rude. Puzzle number 37, world's best golfer. Jack Nicholson? A pro golfer has the amazing ability to consistently putt distances of 3, 5, 7, and 11 feet. Strangely enough... Though, strangely enough, though, those are the only distances he could putt. Currently, our golfer stands on the green with his ball 20 feet from the hole. What's the fewest number of strokes he can use to get the ball into the hole? Assuming that if the ball is hit farther than the distance remaining to the hole, it will roll over the other side without going into the cup. This is reminding me of, like, a joke... Oh my god, like, I had, like, a joke. It was, like, one of those anti-jokes that, like, went on for, like, a million hours about, like, a guy who wanted to impress his boss who, like, loves golf. So he bought him, like, these special clubs that, like, um, always... Oh, wait, yeah! Okay, I remember. Okay, so this is, uh, kind of a weird, but, like, do I tell this joke now? If I do, then, like, it's gonna be the last thing you hear for the episode because it goes on forever. Okay, so I'm going to tell it because you're probably going to be intrigued now. So, as we listen to this calming music and look at this constipated golfer, uh, let's go ahead and tell this story about a man who wants to impress his boss. So, a man wants to impress his boss by getting him a special golf club. He loves golf so much that he wants to get him a good golf club that will impress him and possibly promote him. So, he goes to the store and tries to see what sort of special golf clubs he could get. He talks to the store clerk and says, I need a super special golf club for my super special boss. The store clerk is like, well, I got just what you're looking for, buddy. How's about this? This is a solid gold golf club. Nothing looks fancier than this. So you want to go ahead and buy it? And he's like, yeah, it looks fancy and all, but like, it really is just sort of just a novelty, right? It doesn't really do anything all that special. I don't think he would, he would enjoy all that much. He's like, oh, okay, I know what you're talking about. You want something that performs well as well. Okay, so how about this? This is called the 100 Club. It always hits the ball exactly 100 feet. It's always going to do that, and it's amazing. Want to try it out? He's like, sure, that sounds pretty impressive. So he goes outside with a sword clerk and hits a golf ball with a golf club, and it goes exactly 100 feet. He's like, wow, that's really cool how it always does that. So... So he starts asking the guy again, do uh, you think this is a good present for the guy? He's like, yeah, this is really impressive. This is one of our best clubs. And he's like, you say it's one of your best. you got anything better than this, possibly? And the store clerk is like, all right, you know what? You're special, kid. I think I'm going to get you the best club we got. Come with me into the back room. So they go in the back room, and the store clerk whips out this legendary golf club. The guy says, this is the Infinity Club. Nothing to do with the Infinity Gauntlet. It is the ultimate golf club in which it will hit a ball into the stratosphere and it will never be seen again. It's absolutely legendary and amazing and totally unbelievably good and cool. Your boss will like this more than anything else in the entire world. The guy's like, wow, is this really possible? Can we try it out? And he's like, sure, well, let's go out back. Let's go out back and show it off. So they go outside once again, put a golf ball on the ground, and the guy takes the infinity club, hits it with the golf ball, Uses it to hit the golf ball, and the ball goes into the space and is never seen again. What? You, you don't... you don't get it? Like, seriously? You, you don't get it at all? 
it's it, you, you say it's not funny? Like, you don't understand the joke? Are, are you serious? Like, I worded it perfectly. You, you seriously don't understand it. <sighs> well, now I just feel crummy for, like, wasting your time. Okay, okay, I got a better one then. Uh, just so we don't end this episode on a downer. I'll give you a better joke. So, a guy is going on a business trip across the country, and he is traveling with his pet monkey. He absolutely loves his monkey. It's his best friend, and he can't do anything in life without his monkey by his side. So, he tries to sneak the monkey onto the plane. When he gets in his seat and the plane takes off, the flight attendant actually goes over to his seat and notices that he has a monkey with him. And he's like... Uh, excuse me, sir. Monkeys are not allowed on this plane. You can't have this monkey on a plane. He's like, what? But come on. It's like, he's already up in the air. We're already flying. Like, the monkey's going to be well behaved. You, you don't have to worry about it. It's fine. And the and the flight attendant is just like, uh, no, dude. That's, like, not okay. We got to, like, land the plane. We you might, you might get arrested for this. This is a crime. You can't have the monkey on the plane. And the guy's like, no, no, no. I promise. The monkey is totally well behaved. Like, just let me prove it to you. The flight attendant's just like, okay, fine. So... Uh, what are you going to do? He's like, look at this. He's going to do this awesome card trick. So the guy whips out a pack of cards, gives it to the monkey to uh, shuffle them around. The monkey gives the deck over to the flight attendant, has them pick a card. And then the monkey takes the card back and then shuffles it into the deck. And just like magic, the monkey takes the card out and is able to predict what card the flight attendant picked. Flight attendant's all like, okay, that's pretty impressive, but it still doesn't excuse what you did. You gotta get this monkey off the plane, and you're gonna get in trouble for it. And he's like, no, 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 I promise, this is totally okay. Like, uh, let me just show you another trick. How about, uh, juggling? My monkey can juggle. It's, just, it's so impressive, you gotta check it out. So he takes out these three small balls and gives them to the monkey. Monkey starts juggling them with his hands, he juggles them with his feet, he even juggles them with his tail. He's just really impressive like that. So everyone starts looking over to the other seat because it's a juggling monkey on a plane. Everyone thinks it's really cool and everyone's clapping. Everyone likes the monkey and he's still being well behaved. So things seem to be looking good. And the flight attendant's like, okay, this is all really impressive and all, but I still don't think we could excuse this. We are going to have to land the plane and this monkey has to leave. The guy's like, okay, let me just show you one more trick. If you don't, if you don't accept my monkey after that, then I'm just going to give up. I promise I'll just drop it completely and I'll suffer the consequences for my actions. And the flight attendant's, okay, what do you got? All right, so the guy's like, I'm going to open the window on this plane, and the monkey is going to handstand across the wing of the plane and make it back here in one piece, completely unharmed, while juggling the balls in his feet. And the guy's just like, and the flight attendant's just like, whoa, 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 that just seems way too dangerous. He can't do that. And the guy's just like, no, he's done it a million times. I've been on a million stinking planes with a million stinking monkeys and done a little uh, magic trick like this. He, it's totally fine. He's totally prepared for this. You okay with this monkey? Monkey nods and is ready to do it. So the guy opens up the plane window. Somehow, magically, he has that ability as well. And he lets the monkey walk out onto the window of the plane while it's in the air. The monkey steps out there, gets on his hands, and starts juggling the balls with his feet while making it across the end of the wing. Everyone's really impressed. Everyone keeps looking out the windows to see the monkey walk across the wing. And everyone just thinks it's the coolest thing ever. And it's all really impressive. And everyone really thinks that he's going to be able to make it back okay. And the guy's just like, way to go, monkey. You're the best. And the monkey makes it to the end of the wing. And he is ready to make his way back. The guy's like, okay, monkey, now come on back now. The monkey starts making his way back. But before he can make it back into the window, he gets hit by a golf ball and falls off the plane. You get it? Hint number one, the correct solution doesn't involve the golfer overshooting the hole. Hint number two, there's no reason our golfing friend should have to hit the putt straight toward the hole. Perhaps he could put his ball in a better position with a shot that travels diagonally. Hint number three, picture the golfer taking a diagonal shot relative to the hole. If he hits the ball exactly 11 feet and angles the shot to the first putt, the first putt putts? How convenient, considering we just got done with that game on this channel. Putt puts him exactly halfway between... Oh, putt puts him exactly... Okay, okay, that's a bit... That makes a bit more sense, but still it looks weird. Putt puts him exactly halfway between his striking, his starting position, and the hole. Do you see where this is going? I really don't see where this is going. All I know is that the answer is two. And now to test my theory. 
Done. There we have it. Hope you enjoyed me wasting your time. Good job. Oh, look at the little cow. It looks adorable. If a friend, the pro golfer, puts the diagonal shots as shown above, he could sink the ball in two shots. No one ever said the golfer had to putt directly toward the hole, did they? Sure, in order to sink this putt using the method shown above, he need to calculate the angle of each shot perfectly, but that's probably why he's a pro. Or he just got a really fancy golf club from a really fancy store clerk after murdering a really fancy monkey with it. That's the ticket, very nice! You've got a good head on those shoulders, Sonny. But I guess you need one to pull off that hat. And on that note, I don't really think there's anything I could say or do to top of what I just did, so we're going to end things off right here. Next time on Professor Layton in the Diabolical Box, we're going to continue exploring the village and see what other mysteries we could find. This is Midnight and Beyond, and I will see you all later. Good night.